Alright, so we were here in the last class and um, um, did you guys look up the uh, paper on the semantic web uh, 2001? Did you look at that paper? No? That's, well, that's something really some, you know, all of you should look at. You mean uh, the the patent, the patent, the tally, yeah, the tally. No, no, the paper by uh, Tim Berners-Lee and. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, and then um, I think today we want to talk about um, some of the evolution. Are we talking about the core of semantic technologies as well as um, using search as a primary example to explore a few things? So I mentioned in the last class that um, in the early five years of semantic web in the 2000 uh, to 2005 time frame, there was a lot of emphasis on uh, description logic and um, logic based uh, frameworks. Uh, and then um, this data web came about, uh, I think Tim Bonnesley gave a talk at uh, one of the Boulevard web conference on data web. And then also uh, wrote, uh, he wrote a blog on um, uh, linked data and uh, some four or five principles and then a um, couple of other guys, Chris Bizer and um, Tom Heath, uh, they uh, wrote a very nice survey paper in one of the journals that I was um, editing, Intensive Journal of Semantic Web and Information Systems. Um, and they also, you know, kind of, there's a group in Europe that uh, that uh, manage this new data and um, things move fairly well there. So, the, when we talk about semantics uh, and semantic web, uh, particular semantic web, I would say that there's this three fundamental principles. One is the ontology, or something that captures the agreement, something that um, uh, allows things to interoperate, something where people can have uh, common interpretation. Okay. And um, the fundamental principle is that if um, the data becomes machine processable, then you can improve automation. But how do you make the things, um, you know, but, but, but when the data comes from multiple sources, when it is created by different sources, different humans, different, you know, machines, how can you give that common interpretation? So basically, there needs to be something that acts as a reference. And I was saying that basically, look, in natural language, over the period of time, we evolve common interpretation, common meaning. And if necessary, you go back to um, some commonality that is given to us by dictionaries and thazars, right? Well, what is the counterpart to that? And again, uh, in the natural language, it's primarily still meant for humans to interpret. And, and humans can deal with a lot of ambiguity. Machines can't. And hence, uh, you need uh, things to be specified more concretely, preferably be formal. The second thing then is uh, annotating the data, or uh, what once Tim Bernersley wrote as labeling the data. Right? So um, uh, a very good example um, of the importance of labeling is consider that you uh, go on Flickr or uh, some place where there is large repository of images. How are you going to search for that? We are going to search for that using labels. Mm -hmm. People would have given keywords to describe or they would have given short captions or phrases to describe their images. Mm -hmm. And it is that labeling of that content which makes that content searchable. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, that same principle uh, applies, um, generally speaking, in is a semantic web, give me any kind of data, whether it is a, a web page, a news article, whether it is a, a social media data, whether it is sensor data, and I would label it, I would annotate it. Mm -hmm. The term I use here is semantic annotation, mm -hmm. meaning annotate, when you do annotation in Flickr, it is unconstrained, you can put, type in whatever word you want, mm -hmm. right, unless there is some sort of autocomplete, in which case, uh, you are going to reuse some labels. Mm -hmm. But um, if you label with respect to that ontology mm -hmm. or some common vocabulary or model, mm -hmm. then I would call that 
semantic labeling because common meaning, remember semantics, meaning and use, that commonality is given to you through the use of this ontology or something that is that stands for ontology, right? Now this labeling process can be manual um, as you do in image labeling most of the time. It can be semi-automatic or it can be automatic. So uh, there is no one size that fits all. Um, it all depends on the different situations and we'll in this course come about, you know, discuss several of them. The um, there's one uh, uh, thing that I want to talk about, which is this term metadata. Uh, and this is a, a term that has been used for a long time, even before uh, so-called semantics and semantic web became um, uh, more popular. The term metadata has been, metadata is data about data, right? Or it's some sort of description about the data, something that tells you something more about the data. And um, it comes in many different forms. So uh, a while ago, I read um, an article from a system to syntax to structure to semantics. Okay, this was in 1998, 99. And you know, so that the, yeah, this is the article. That in fact, uh, let me see if that will show up. So this is the article. Uh, changing the focus of on interpretability in information systems from system, syntax, structure to semantics. Right, and I describe these different terms and how that gives you a better level of interoperability. Now this article was written during the time when um, uh, I think the, the focus used to be on um, uh, uh, the focus used to be on structured data. Uh, so I will um, you know not go much into detail there. But uh, let's look at just to understand those terms. Let's just look at this pyramid to understand those terms. So you start with the data, and data comes in many forms. And one, one um, uh, way of describing different forms of the data is that, oh, this is a structured data. Uh, you know, it's tables like rows, uh, as in relational database. It is uh, semi-structured data, as in kind of XML. You have tags and things like that. Or it is unstructured data. It's just plain text kind of thing, right? But there, uh, and, you know, but there can be also other form of uh, talking about data, say the data of different modality. So you have uh, text-centric text data versus images and video and audio and uh, sequencing data and so on and so forth, right? So that is another sort of forms of data. So you have all variety of data. And then synthetic metadata will be talking about, uh, you know, things like what language the thing is in, what format it is in, or modality. Just saying, oh, this is an image data. Uh, or what, uh, what is the size of the document? Right? How many bits or bytes it has? These are all so-called syntactic kind of stuff. Who owns the data? And then comes structured data that tells you about how data is organized. That does not tell you anything about the meaning of the data, but tell, tells you about the organization of the data. Right? It allows you to go uh, uh, to different parts of the data. So oh, there's a heading of the data. That is um, a subheading of the data. That is the paragraph in the data. Right? And so, again, depending upon the language, uh, suppose I'm talking about HTML, then I would have this H1 and H2 and things of that nature, right? I have a P for paragraph. This will, these are the um, things that help you structure the data. Then comes semantic metadata. Now you start talking about what the data is about. What does it mean to a human or an application, right? So there you can say, oh, if suppose I have an image data, and then they say, oh, in that image, that is upper abdomen, right? Now that is semantics, that is meaning. It means something to us, to humans, to application. That photograph was taken to get, you know, for example, capture human anatomy, right? Or, or this, let's say it's, an, it's a radiology image, right? And so it was not taken to uh, say what size data is in or what format data is in. It was taken for the purpose of showing an abdomen or an abscess in the abdomen, right? That is the semantic thing. So when you start talking about, now when you label, when you label that image, that is semantic annotation or semantic metadata. So you will have things of that nature. But see what happens here. You see label, so this is a region of anatomy, upper anatomy. Organ is liver. So you see this vocabulary here, right? This is what 
will constitute the core of the semantic, uh, core of the ontological descriptions. Right? This is these are the kind of concepts or classes you have in ontology, and then there will be values. Right? So this will be class kind of thing, and there will be a value, a whole bunch of value of all kinds of you know uh, anatomical regions, right? Or all kinds of you know here is a class organ, and all kinds of different uh, you know uh, or, or organs would be the values for that, right? And so that is described as an ontology here. So that becomes the reference. This becomes use of that reference to label the data. Right? And as you go from this bottom of the pyramid to higher up, you have high so-called expressiveness. Right? You have a more, uh, you're semantic. You're becoming more semantic going up there. Uh, there's another very um, relevant, uh, uh, you know, classification, a little different way of looking at this thing, which is also very important, which plays a very important role in abstraction. In that, um, how do you, you know, this shows, again, another way how you go from data to something that is really uh, uh, not only really meaningful, but something that can be acted upon. At the end of the day, why you collect the data? Well, it helps you make a better decision. And right? give you an insight. You want to understand something. So, suppose I have a, a blood pressure, you know, uh, meter, right? Or, or measurement unit. What will it give you? It will give you number 150. It's a string or a number, right? Well, that by itself is raw data. It's really not much, there's not much meaning to that, right? But then you start, um, you know, saying that you start labeling the data, saying it is a systolic blood pressure of 150 mmHg. You label the data. 150 became somewhat meaningful. It has some level of meaning. Not if you see in the previous picture, I said you know level of semantics. Mm -hmm. I didn't describe all those levels. This one kind of gives you some further uh, understanding of that. So. Um, but by the but, but what, what happens is that uh, it is still something whose implication is not all that valuable. It's just saying that this is systolic blood pressure of 150. So what? It's some number. I don't know what this means to a to a lay person, right? But then you say, oh, it is elevated blood pressure. Now I say, what is the significance? Right? It's normal versus elevated. Okay? And then, but an uh, interesting thing is that sometimes such information is still not sufficient for making a decision. For example, a doctor cannot decide what medication to give you based on uh, just knowing that this is an elevated preparation. Because that itself does not tell you what disease it is based on which you can give a medication. For that you have to decide because elevated blood pressure is a condition which can occur because of hypertension, a disease or hyperthyroidism, another disease. For either of those there will be different medications that will be relevant. So you still have to go one more level up and, and figure, the out, figure that out. right? So now you are seeing uh, even, so this, this gives you an idea that when you use the word semantics, it's still, usually it is very vague. I can call, the, some people call this semantic. Somebody will call this semantic, mm -hmm. this is certainly semantic. Mm -hmm. But there are levels of that, we call this levels of abstraction. Right? And here on the side I show you uh, different um, languages and ways we can actually capture that, that different level of abstraction. So we'll, you know, uh, learn a little bit about RDF and OWL and things of the nature and why we use these languages, the richnesses that they have and the role that they play in capturing uh, richer semantics. Okay? What do you mean by SSN ontology? Uh, SSN uh, stands for Semantic Sensor Networking. In this case, uh, this example happens to be one that is uh, related to data captured by a sensor. Uh, blood pressure meter is a type of sensor. 
And so um, uh, a one of the particular, um, you know, for sensor data that has been worked, uh, you know, by Worldwide World Consortium. I co-founded, I initiated that group, and I co-founded that group, uh, co you know, co-chaired that group that led to this development of this ontology. And one of my former student, uh, Cody Hansen, who used to sit, uh, you know, where uh, Ricardo now sits, uh, he was the key person who developed that. Uh, uh, that and uh, a lot of other people. So you see there's a paper by... It's funny because I'm working with it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and, uh, and, and a number of people worldwide work on this. And uh, so that's very um, well-cited paper on that. Um, and, uh, okay. and then he, he worked on this interlogo in the top, you can see here, that goes into actionable information. Something you can act upon. It's a very, very powerful thing. So, uh, the third part of the, you know, the simplified uh, repress, uh, you know, uh, component of semantic web is um, the reasoning uh, or computation, any computation. So reasoning sometimes is too um, geeky a word, but any form of thing that exploits that annotation, that better understanding of what the data is about, you know, uh, is the third component. So this may involve search. If you can use semantics to improve search, as we'll discuss, it can you can use semantics to do better integration. So, for example, I have um, uh, you know one of the students uh, works on uh, traffic and transportation in the traffic, and he looks at the traffic data uh, uh, based uh, of three types: physical, cyber, and social. Physical through road sensor networks. Cyber, like uh, there's something called event, where, you know, event, uh, eventful, which uh, and file org, which tells you about various events that occurs, like uh, sports event, music event, uh, traffic, uh, you know, tra uh, road street surfacing, mm -hmm. and social people tweet, yeah. you know. So when there is uh, bad weather and uh, a particular exit is, uh, you know, closed off, well, people will tweet. I right? can you get that information, but then. He uses semantics to combine all the three types of data. Suppose um, there is a, um, a traffic event, let's say uh, an accident. Uh, there is possibility that there will be data of, from all the three different sources. There will be road sensor data, traffic became slow. Mm -hmm. There will be a data police report put up on the web, available through the web. And there will be people, uh, tweets that people might, might have put up, or Instagram or whatever, social data. All of them relate to the traffic incidents, real, real world event or phenomena, right? Mm -hmm. So then your, the computation here is that of integration. He's able to fuse or integrate data of different modality and then use all of that data in his decision making. You can do answering, you can do query mm -hmm. uh, answering, so ask questions and give the answers. Uh, you can uh, find subgraphs and paths, you can find patterns. Right? You can mine uh, things saying, oh, these are the similar things. Uh, you can hypothesize and validate in the biomedical and many other disciplines. Right? You can discover what is new that the data reveals that was not known before. You can visualize. So these are all the various forms of computations that can be facilitated by uh, semantic, uh, semantics, semantic annotations, and so on. Right? Yeah. I mean, um, that's something that regards this place in my research. You know, you know, I'm working on a system that does stream reasoning, so reasoning on the fly, mm. uh, in the condition that you have too much, too many data that you cannot store, or that are changing too much that storing them it requires too much time. Uh, to solve this problem, I just understood the difference between reasoning and computation. You know that sometimes reasoning is not enough; you have to integrate with different technologies, and it's kind of you know not hard to uh, to, to welcome this idea, but is a different problem, right? But right. So, so, so if we, when we, um, you know, the people like say early days of semantic web, and even now some researchers say, oh, I will have OWL and I would have uh, RDF and I will do the things. Real in reality, many times that is that's not enough. Right. What do you do with, um, um, you know, uh, unless you you are given a raw data stream of sensor data, you need to get the data into some common format right. uh, and you need to correlate the data with some other data and so on and so forth. You need to map the data, you need to uh, you know, change the units. There are a lot of other things that needs to be done. 
exactly right and before you can uh, do quote unquote reasoning right and my my question is in general if i believe that a uh, processing is valuable because it gives you the opportunity to bring su such a level of data to another one uh, but there is no data availability of data already because you know there is no system so why should people develop this kind of data is it reasonable to provide by yourself the data what i mean i'm processing rdf streams there, is, there are not so, so many co so common right now but i mean if the process if the the technology who can process them became scalable, they, may, they might be pro, uh, common in the future. So is it reasonable to get an assumption, a strong assumption like the data will be available soon? Or is to, you know, you are taking the perspective of an engineer and not a researcher in general. I mean, you are forgetting, I try to explain better. There are, there are two problems in my research, the processing and the, 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 the data delivery. Okay, I'm focusing on the processing, assuming that the delivering is solved, but it's not right now, not in general. Is it reasonable or is something that uh, is missing a big part? Usually, um, I, you know, people follow all kinds of research approaches. Our approach usually is that we always get the data. Okay. And not assume that the data will be there. In fact, a lot of time, um, I would ask students to manually do the computation they want to do on the data. Mm -hmm. First collect the data and actually see what they want to see. And show that manually you can do that. Then you automate it. You, you know, right. Then you write the programs. Then you write uh, you know, algorithms, whatever it is to do it faster and you know, better, you know, smarter and all that stuff. So, so um, ideally, actual human inspection of data and understanding of what the data looks like is very important. Very often the data comes in a different format, you have to, your quality is not good, there are missing data items. Many of those questions have to be solved in the real world. And I would rather have the real data and demonstrate the research results on real data than to just assume that there will be data. That, that, that's a preference of our work. Now, what happens is that, you know, um, there is this, uh, the, for a while, this semantic web stack became very uh, popular. It's also called semantic web layer cake. And the idea was that um, uh, you wanted to, um, okay, so, so this, was, this was basically the layer, uh, uh, you know, cake that became very popular. You start with these basic web things, right, like uh, URI and um, XML. And uh, the other things that are common, like cryptography or encryption, whatever things that you do, right? Now, this thing here you see in this color are the core of what is called a semantic web. So, RDF is the foundational layer, and RDF allows you to represent semantic data right? or metadata or things of that nature. RDFS is uh, uh, sort of uh, schema, RDF schema. We'll look at that later on. So you want to represent the concept as a group, right? just like classes uh, in any object language. And then you have query language for that, call, you know, Sparkle, just like you have SQL for relational database. And then uh, there is this uh, language called the web ontology, uh, web ontology language, and um, this. Uh, is to represent the data at high level of abstractions, it in a more richer form. So you can represent constraints and things of that nature and do inferencing on the data if you were to use uh, ISO based on description logic. And there are variants of that right now, so it's called um, R2 standard, right? Uh, all these are the things that are uh, being, uh, RIF is rule interchange format. So this is for specifying rules. Uh, even though RIF is mentioned here, SWOL, uh, you know, one that was defined before, is uh, very often used. Um, and these are the uh, kind of standards that uh, the World Wide Web Consortium has developed um, and are uh, used at varied, various levels. Um, and then there are other things that go on the top of it, and some people are, you know, trust is important thing, and so on and so forth. A proof. 
not many people care about those things, some do. Um, I will make a, a, in my world of semantic web, uh, I will use RDF wherever it makes sense to me, but I would not always use RDF. In, some in many cases, for me, a graph, any graph representation is good enough and allows me to do what I want to do. Right? So, there was a while ago, uh, in I think uh, uh, 2002, uh, let's see if I can, uh, um, let's go to, yes, this one here. This is 2013, okay, here. So, um, here, uh, in 2002, I talked about this thing here called relationship at the heart of semantic web. And then uh, the key, you know, perspective, the role that a relationship plays in modeling, in discovering, in exploring uh, things, and so on and so forth. But the point is, and then there is some some more about things about it. Um, the most important point here is that when you think about semantics, the fundamental construct that is necessary to capture semantics is relationship. So there are a couple of um, perspective I will give you. So why why would I not call um, relational database a semantic um, uh, representation of data? Re because unlike say RDF, you do not there have relationship as a first class object. You might have value based referencing and foreign key and other things of that nature that may imply a relationship. But you don't have a labeled edge, a relationship that is named, a named relationship. So that to me is the very fundamental concept of semantics. Now this realization that relationships are very important is not uh, entirely new. So I wouldn't say that the 2002, uh, in the semantic web, you know, when the term semantic web came, perhaps uh, I try to emphasize that quite a bit in starting very early on in the semantic web. But there is a very influential article that uh, Vannevar Bush wrote in 1945. Mm -hmm. And he, the title of that article is, As We May Think. And in that, um, he used to be, uh, you know, a scientist at DARPA, and uh, and also, you know, in fact, recently I visited MIT. There's a room, you know, with his name. Um, I think he was a professor there too. Um, and so, in that, he talked about Memex, a machine that would mimic human brain. Mm -hmm. But then he also talked about, like, say, how does our brain works? And he basically said. A brain latches onto a context, a, a concept, and then travels to another mm. concept in context. The travels relationship, and he used the word trailblazing. So, um, if you think about any computerized form of representation, if you talk about a node, you can label it. You can call whatever you want. And then we can argue, oh, does it mean same to you or me? But once we start saying this thing and it relates to that, it relates to that, it relates to that, you are able to be, uh, you, you are able to make it very concrete, much more meaningful, much more distinguishable, and you are able to disambiguate it. So for example, there are, let's say, 10 person by name Amit Shah. But, so, they are there, the 10 nodes by that name. You can't distinguish between 1 and 2. You can say a mission 1, a mission 2, a mission 3. The other day I was trying to create a Quora, on Quora sec, a second account, I have an account Amit Seth 1. Probably maybe uh, I was the first one to have that name and have an account. 
then somehow, for whatever reason, another account got created. It was Amitya 12. That means there are at least other, you know, 10 Amitya's uh, in Quora. That's his name. That's his label. That doesn't give you enough meaning. The moment then you start associating this node, only one of them will be associated with Noesis and Rice State University. At least Noesis or Rice State University. Or, or, or a professor of computer science in Rice State University, right? Mm -hmm. That is a link. Right? He's a faculty of, he's a director of, whatever those things are. With that label, you make the meaning concrete. Okay. Right? Richer. As that is what, so relationship is the fundamental construct, uh, a necessary construct uh, to have semantics. And um, the importance of RDA for me is that it is probably the first standardized model, a representation where relationship is first class object. Right? So um, relationship has been there in a number of different forms, there's linking in object oriented uh, models and so on and so forth. Here the lateral relationship with label that became first class object and that is really that has really allowed us to represent a lot more relationship in the model and represent language than, let's say, what we had before, in particularly in relational databases. But don't we like in the relational databases some, we can actually show some relationships, I mean, without labeling, but for example, if I have like, uh, Amit Shet is a director of Noesis, then uh, that is a relationship. We can actually say in RDF that this is, this is, uh, we can give it a label, but in the relation databases, we can actually get the feel of that relationship from the join of t maybe two or three tables. Exactly. Right? You have to do the join. Yeah. Or uh, you have to make a find key. So yes. uh, you have referential integrity constraints. There are all this indirect way, but in RDF. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. That's okay. Right. That's the edge. And that's so we are interested in just like that. implicitly, like just showing it there. Yeah, you can. That's that is right. And if you that, think about. If you think about That's it, not first class object. Okay. If you think about the tools that automatically translates, let's say, for relational database to RDF, they need a, a taxonomy to annotate the data and produce the triples. Well, so they are not semantic. They have to add the semantic. To exactly. And that is often you, have, you need human input to uh, provide the missing semantics so that mm -hmm. because you are going from uh, less rich to a richer model. There's a lot of work on so called database translation, multiple models. And the challenge is always you have, um, if you go from low, uh, less rich model to richer model, the missing semantics have to be supplied by human. Uh, typically, that semantics is captured in the application program that somehow you have to be ex made, made explicit. If you go from higher, richer uh, model to a lower, um, uh, you know, less rich model, then you will not be able to represent some uh, richness that has been captured, or you have to use indirect constructs to capture them. Yeah. And there is a meaning, because if I think of a database, it's meaningful within a company or an organization mm. where there is no need to integrate data. Mm. Everything is not ambiguous by design. Mm. I mean, we agree, for us, a contract is something. We are in the same company, everybody shares the same idea of contract. The problem comes when I meet someone else yeah. that has his own yeah. concept. So yeah. that's why it means so, missing the... Yeah, so that is where then, um, you know, uh, what happens, another type of relationship um, in semantic web is when you take an object, a data item, and you refer to ontological construct. Right. Saying that this is a that, this is, you know, of type that. Right? So I'm talking about this person, it is person of type faculty that is described there in the model. Right? So that is another very important uh, form in which we Excellent make reference. the relationship explicit or uh, meaning explicit. But uh, these relations may differ in different ontologies. I mean, if you consider uh, a particular person as a professor in right, uh, Amit Seth as professor in Wright State University, in some other ontology we will con we'll be considering a citizen of US or something. Yes. So when we are uh, using both the ontologies and we are trying to extract some data, will, they, will it be something like ambiguous? 
because we have some is, we have yeah. different relations over there yeah okay. and and you would have and the, so there is no problem in taking some data and annotating with regards to multiple ontologies okay you can do that right and in fact you should do that if that is what is necessary for you or that's valuable for you so also like with the help of labels or metadata we can't exactly know the specific type of person then like uh, we need to look at the data right let us say like in the main data like you will be providing like you are working at this pro, uh, university and uh, you are working in this particular state so you know like uh, if we couldn't extract this data from the metadata like ontology or semantics or anything so there is the necessity that we have to look into the main data right so do we exactly look into the main data to extract that what do you mean by main data here in your uh, you mean for building i mean you i mean think he built data. i mean building the ontology for building the ontology yes of for course yes. you would have for example in reference data set uh, uh, if you have that I item uh, mm -hmm. i'll give you an example um, let's say john smith okay mm -hmm. and let's say there is one john smith who is a business person another john smith who is a baseball player okay. now you will have to make a determination as to, in a particular text where there is occurrence of John Smith, whether that John Smith happens to be, uh, uh, you know, first you decide that's the name of a person, mm -hmm. and then you say, but there are multiple of them, which one is this? And that is a distinguished process. I, I will come to that uh, a little bit later on and explain to you how one way it can be done, or how we had done it in one of the systems that we built. Now, this is a very interesting slide that somebody had made. Uh, he used to be at Cisco at that point of time. Now he's a GE called, uh, his name is Bill Rue. Uh, that this semantic web characters are self describing, it's easy to understand, is issued by trusted authority, uh, it's machine and human readable, it's convertible, and it can be secured. Um, and then he said, if you take a variety of different type of data, use XML, RDF, ontology and uh, you can build a semantic web kind of stuff. I won't go into the details of each of them, but there are various pieces of the things that can help you achieve that to some level. Not everything is uh, exactly the semantic web, but the web, core web plus semantic web together allows you to achieve all of these critical things. Now there are, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're going to have classes later on which will focus on these things, so I won't go into detail today. But just to give you an idea, so this is RDF is used to, for example, uh, represent things like this. That IBM is, uh, uh, you know, a company that is located at uh, Armok, New York, in the United States, and uh, it has headquarters, headquartered there, or that it has a research lab located in there. And this kind of stuff can be represented using RDF language, and it became a standard, I think, as early as 1998. And then, um, you know, there is a, a, you know, RDF is sort of represented as triple. Uh, so, you have also called subject, mm -hmm. predicate, mm -hmm. attribute, property, various, various different terms that I use, and uh, okay. object, value of the property. Okay, so that's a fundamental construct for uh, thing. And these have URIs, and hence uh, they become, um, you may want to uh, look up, uh, you know, Wikipedia or other things to understand the distinction between a URL, URI, and RI, I, uh, IRI. Uh, in our web information system class, we try to distinguish this thing and go into those kind of basic things. Um, and you use namespaces also uh, to qualify some of these things. Um, there are two types of property where there's here is a web resource and here is a literal. So. Uh, again, we'll come to this later on. When we want to represent these kind of group things, these are IBM is located at, uh, Oracle is located at that, so you want to just describe company or geographical location. So that's why we need the schema mm -hmm. representation, and that's why uh, we can come up with that, so RDFS. Again, I won't go into detail here, but I want to give you intuitive understanding today. Uh, ontology. Uh, and this can take, you know, I, we can have an entire course just talking about ontology. Um, ontologies are shared conceptualization of a domain 
represented in formal language. So in, this was a, a paraphrase of um, uh, Tom Gruber. Uh, he was a student, I think, at Stanford, and uh, I think his thesis, well, he completed his thesis in 1993. Um, and by the way, this Tom Gruber, his third company was Siri. He was co-founder or founder of Siri, which then was acquired by yeah. Apple. Okay, and so you know, um, the two uh, uh, fairly, uh, I think, influential guys uh, coming from uh, Stanford in that uh, arena at that, that time frame. One is Tom Kruber, other is um, uh, Ramnath Guha. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ramnath Guha is now at uh, Orec, uh, sorry, at Google. Google. But uh, Ramnath Guha uh, came up with MCF. Uh, and MCF was the precursor to RDF. Okay? So that I think he understood clearly as he did MCF that role of relationship. Mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and that's why we give a lot of credit to him there. there. Um, um, all right, so um, ontologies uh, are common representational model. So they, you know, what, what, what do they give you? They give facilitate interoperability, they integrate, they, you know, they help with the integration, uh, they enforce consistent use of terminology, um, and, and, and they can support reasoning to discover implicit knowledge. Now, for there are many different um, forms in which you can represent the core essence of what ontology is for, which is a reference or referent, right? And uh, it may be as simple, just like I said. Well, you know, we humans you may uh, resort to a dictionary. Suppose you are uh, playing. Um, uh, a word game and you uh, don't agree that that's a real world or not, you will know, we'll say let's consider a dictionary, right? Or we are arguing about meaning, we'll look up thazaras for dictionary. So you can start with that uh, kind of stuff, but um, it's not formal per se. You need national language to interpret the things. Um, and you know, here you see it at this extreme, this database schema, you can call that as some reference, but Schema, you know, schema typically does not capture semantics, it's still a structure only, representative only. And then you come, uh, you start with this um, a representation, WordNet, uh, which is um, a uh, representation for a language. And it has several types of relationships, and uh, somebody has manually set down. There's a um, group at uh, Princeton that started this work. and have built this thing now, WordNet is kind of being built in multiple languages. But they're, they're cap capturing uh, uh, and uh, uh, what would the common things in the national language. Right? So they will, uh, this is a kind of that. They will capture those kind of relationship you know, for the words, terms in the natural language. In, the, in this case, let's say this is the English language. Then, um, but this is not quite formal yet. It's not something that you can automate per se, right? And you cannot. Uh, so it's, it's not something you can reason about. So uh, then, then there are other kind of representations, common representations, unified uh, medical library system, uh, uh, or language system. I forget. Unified modeling language. Unified modeling language. Unified modeling language system. Yes, exactly. Unified modeling language system. So, so that is the you know there to capture the terms in a particular domain, right? Medical mm -hmm. domain. And then you, on one hand, you are uh, and then you can see here uh, some of the uh, knowledge represent the construct. So, is a construct, right? And uh, you would have you know instance something instance. So uh, what happens here is that two fundamental um, thing are class hierarchies and ESA construct and class membership, right? And these are there in most uh, uh, you know formal representations. Then you can start adding to that various things like value restrictions and various other things like disjointness or 
where you can even go to patronomy and parts and so on and so forth, and then all the way to so-called general logical constraints. And these are, by the way, uh, here you see various um, uh, uh, ontologies that um, uh, uh, people have developed, example of ontologies. People have called them ontologies, but they are at different level of representation. Mm -hmm. One very well known quote unquote ontology, which is not um, people who believe in formal constructs or you know, description logic and other things, they do not call that as a formal ontology, but that is probably the best known ontology is go ontology, gene ontology. Mm -hmm. And it is mainly a nomenclature. Formally, it is a nomenclature, not really uh, ontology, it can, it's not captured in OWL, let's say. Um, now, uh, this uh, K uh, is uh, another one in, used in biomedical, uh, Kyoto uh, something. And now, Sweto, Glyco, these were developed by my group uh, over the period of time. Uh, this was, um, I think one of the earliest ontology to have about million concepts. Um, Glyco, I'll show you, it was for complex carbohydrate, a very complex ontology, literally. And so, so, bio, so you can see that they're going into the richer representation along that line. Owl is a standard, it's, and this is kind of old slide here, and uh, you know, um, these dimensions are ones that uh, McGinnis and uh, team Fine um, had uh, an earlier picture of this guy was created by them. Or this core picture was created by them, in fact. Is there like a, a tutorial or something on how to build an ontology? Yes. Well, there is a tutorial. In fact, McGinnis and uh, uh, Natasha Noy has a so called Ontology 101. Mm -hmm. And you can find uh, you know videos also on the web, as well as uh, I think more, more slides might be on the web also. And, uh, uh, and they use, for example, the Wine ontology as the you know pedagogical example to to walk you through. So uh, it's was certainly worth uh, you know going through that as a what okay, what many will call a, a, an ontology and and uh, you know one of the tools because it is also open source. Uh, Pro Protege became very popular and they kind of use that in their their, their course. Since then, some other people have joined a um, subset of Natasha, either Natasha or McGinnis and Gave, uh, Deborah McGinnis and Gave, given this, this tutorial. Um, so, uh, and there is this, this OWL2, which is now the current standard, and there are again a number of things about it. I'm not going to go through this detail. The slide is, these slides are available, you can walk through them, and yes, there's some examples of that. Uh, Sparkle is a query language, again. And we're going to go through that in ne next week. We will we'll go through Sparkle. And, um, but let me, so nowadays, now, now, now there are literally th hundreds of ontologies. Mm -hmm. There's one place called Nest, uh, you know, OBO, Open Biological Ontology and Bioportal, mm -hmm. uh, where you can find more than 300 ontologies in biomedical domain. Uh, including a couple of the, those that we have developed, or my group has developed, uh, you know, over the period of time. Uh, called, one of them is called Propio. Now, ontology can be relatively simple. So here is a uh, here is a subset of one uh, ontology where I'm only showing this easy relationship in that ontology mm -hmm. that was created for representing drugs. So you can say uh, uh, there's our thing, uh, and then there is a you know a here a class prescription drug. And then you say there's a brand name prescription drug or a, a generic uh, prescription drug. And then there's an individual for that. Right? So this is a very simple, really simple ontology. Or there can be very complex ontology. So this ontology, for example, tries to capture, this is a complex biological pathway. In this case, it's a end glycosylation metabolic pathway. Probably doesn't mean anything to most of you. But uh, this is basically some enzymes in the body and how they, uh, you know, get uh, with certain chemicals and transform into some other forms and how proteins are generated and so on and so forth. So this is describing this biological, uh, you know, and this is called glutenec one and there's another thing called, and this is basically, you can see a chemical process, you know, organic chemistry, you can see here, basically. And that process, it's pretty complex. Relatively, you have to represent the very complex structure. It's not like a name of a person. It's you know, a complex carbohydrate molecule. 
So you have to model that and you have to model the transformations also. So here is, for example, uh, you know, construct that uh, one of my student, uh, um, uh, Christopher Thomas built, working with biochemists who knew the domain knowledge. And so here is another thing called glutenic 5 It's uh, implicated in some cancer. And again, you are representing that uh, particular ontology and those, you can see how complex represents there are. So it just kind of gives you a visual feeling that ontology can be incredibly complex. So let's give, get a fun, fundamental um, picture about what these annotations are about, right? And how you do that and just some examples of that. So let's look at this. So the idea here is that you have a variety of objects on the web, on the internet, and so on and so forth. And what you want to do is to be able to create a metadata. And we talked about various types of metadata, right? Structured metadata, mm -hmm. syntactic, structural, semantic metadata, and so semantic annotation. We talked about those things. So for a given variety type of data, let's say I have AP news story, mm -hmm. or I have digital image, I have a digital audio, I have digital map, I have uh, video, whatever it is, right? For any one of those things, I have sensor data. I want to be able to uh, have an uh, extractor or annotator and have the annotation mm -hmm. or extraction. So here is a, an example. And you can see that, by the way, this was uh, created in 2002. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, this is uh, when my company, uh, Tali, it was about to be acquired by Vuket. But this was done by this com company that I found in 1999. So here you can see a new story. And you can see what the annotator did. Mm -hmm. So it says, look, that there's a phrase here. It says there's a phrase here. It says, this is a company. Mm -hmm. And when you see this hypertext, it is a link to the uh, description, uh, uh, concept, that concept mm -hmm. in the ontology. Mm -hmm. So the ontology is concept called company mm -hmm. and instances of all the companies. Mm -hmm. All the publicly traded companies on the three stock markets, NASDAQ, OTC and uh, you know uh, MX and uh, uh, Dow uh, and um, the other one I forget. But basically, all the stocks that are traded, it has that knowledge, and then the annotator mm -hmm. he finds says that oh, Microsoft is that. What does it mean? This once you do that, you get a lot of power. Why? Because now ontology knows that. All the, the relationships that it has, so the one that you are showing here, if there is a company that might have a competitor. Exactly, uh, the company has stock symbol, MSFT, company Microsoft. Having a CEO, company will be founded by somebody. Exactly. It's located at some place. Right. And that so, is the power. Exactly. So, so, so you can see here uh, we found Europe is a continent, Middle East. Now remember. I, I would have probably one ontology or one component of ontology that focuses on companies and all the business stuff and totally other one which will call, focus on all the political and geographical region and all that stuff, right? Geo names and... Mm -hmm. So um, here you can see Solomon Smith Barney which I don't think is a company anymore which was acquired or went away. PeopleSoft which was acquired by Oracle. Mm -hmm. And you can see here the Standards and Poor's Final Index, which is a financial index. index. It's an n-gram, mm -hmm. right? That was identified as a, a concept yeah. and mapped to the ontology. So, <clears throat> it, uh, in year two, in this, uh, I think around 2000 or so, <coughs> we were able to process one million documents per hour per server. Of these documents of this size, so not very large document, but uh, this this is a typical document. So these things, all the things you see, we call that them semantic annotations. So um, this was the patent uh, we filed in two thousand, or in two thousand one well before uh, the 2001 article, right? Mm -hmm. And you can see the title of this thing, Cement System and Method for Creating a Semantic Web <coughs> and its Applications in Browsing, Searching, Profiling, Personalization, and Editing. 
these were my two former students. <coughs> and they were also employees of Tali, the company that formed. And here you can see now parts of the ontology. This is not all of what we have, but some parts. You can see a set is the top level, and this is a news set. And then there was a, you know, and then the subtypes. And there's a sports set, which I, you can see there are football, basketball. Within football, for example, then you'll have professional football and college football, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Like that. Yeah. So we had created a fairly comprehensive um, ontology, um, same level of general representation as a knowledge graph of people. Right? Uh, that's practically, and we call in the pattern, we use both the words ontology and world model. So, so there were quite a few uh, applications that were built, early semantic search, uh, then there are enterprise application focused on healthcare and life science, financial security, uh, and then a uh, variety of different types, so sensor and uh, web of data, social data, internet of things. So here is a, this one is, for, this was our first kind of implementation more or less. And uh, one of our first ap application was to build audio, video, web search engine, semantic search engine. So you can see here, this is that ontology. And depending upon the type of objects you're interested in, you can you you you'll get a faceted search interface box. All you know in a version of this, all of them had a keyword box. Is, is the same as like typing something in a Google search box. But if you want it, you can tell the system, I am going to type in your name of a artist or say a name of a uh, <coughs> uh, you know uh, 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 movie uh, artist versus name of a uh, uh, singer. Right? So you can make that distinction. So system understands better. When you do that, the system will give you all these kind of results. And then it will build, uh, you know, this kind of rich media objects. So it will give you a variety of details, uh, the title, da 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 da. Remember, in today Google search, you have this called info box on the right. That's the same idea, right? Plus, in this case, we are doing, you know, audio video. So the link, direct link to play that video audio will also come up. Plus, we are doing uh, semantic merchandise advertisement and. Um, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, e-commerce. E so here, right there, I'll get you, take you directly to the Amazon web page. And Amazon in those days had referral fee, so you can make money by you know uh, referring to them, and uh, you know then they make money by selling the market merchandise. Now things are different; uh, is a little different. <coughs> so, so um, this is the uh, directory thing. So we type Commerce One, which was then acquired by some other company. As soon as you do that, the system knows that you are looking at business entity. And the other thing related to business thing, like industry that Commerce One belongs to, a stock symbol, all those things will be something that system will automatically make you available. These are the facets, right? So you look for Commerce One, and the system will give you all the directory level information. So the following company competes with Commerce One. The following is the executive uh, associated with Commerce One. Commerce One is a member of following industries, corporate professional financial software. Commerce One uh, is identified uh, by the following sticker symbol. Uh, Commerce One competes with the following companies. Uh, other frequently mentioned company with Commerce One are these. And then you click on them and you can get actually item, news items or assets associated with those things that were already searched from the web pages, indexed and made available in a organized form. Here you type in uh, David Duval. Now it understands that it is uh, because this is of type golf and then there is all this golf related stuff. So the semantic directory. This is <coughs> coming from this paper. So let me go to that paper and then I'll 
I'll discuss this. This is this paper. Um, uh, semantic content on the web, and there's another related paper for that. I'll show you. So this is a paper managing semantic content for the web, and there's another paper. <coughs> From which that uh, thing is this, this paper title of the paper is Search Semantic Enhancement Engine, and, and in principle it was also discussing part of semantic engine that we had, which is semantic search engine basically. The word I, I did not use was but search here, but that's exactly what it is. And it's a module document enhancement platform for semantic applications, application including a search for heterogeneous content. Now I'll show you a couple of things. So this is a um, this is the um, uh, pipeline mm. of data processing. So you have text, and I'm not showing the crawling component here. Mm. So that's there already. But then you have a classification module. So the interesting thing here was that um, <clears throat> I gave you the earlier example, right? So you have uh, you know Tom Smith, mm -hmm. and there are multiple Tom Smith. Well, we wanted to. Uh, uh, Given a concept, uh, given a content, we would classify it first mm -hmm. into a domain. Because you saw earlier in that patent uh, picture, we had different ontologies for different domains. So we had sports ontology, I showed you. Similarly, we have entertainment ontology. Similarly, we have business ontology, right? So for every variety of domains, we had ontologies, mm -hmm. right? These, these are different groups of um, sub, sub, sub knowledge subgraph, right? Subgraphs of knowledge mm -hmm. graph. This is what they are. And so what we wanted to do was that, hey, if I <coughs> classify a concept to um, a particular domain, then I will use domain-specific description. Because for every domain, I have different things. If it is a music content, I'm looking for artist name, I'm looking for record label, I'm looking for a music director, I'm looking for uh, genre. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for uh, album name, I'm looking for track name. These are the properties, uh, concepts that are relevant to music. I know what kind of things are contextually relevant. Mm -hmm. But if it was muse, uh, movie, I'll be looking for movie name, yeah. uh, director's name, uh, recording stu you know, movie studio, uh, movie genre, different than music genre, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, right? So, um, the idea would be that I would extract the metadata, semantic metadata, and or do semantic annotation that are relevant to the kind of content that that is. So for that, we do the classification, mm -hmm. right? Once we classify, we know what are the type of objects. Now, see, because the search engines of those time days, and even today, most of the search engines, they will index whatever are the uh, objects that they can find. But they, those objects are not very really semantic objects. Only now they are starting to do that. Only since 2013 that you know uh, Google started to do semantic search. Before that they didn't do that, right? Uh, you know, before that they still started developing um, you know basic understanding of uh, names of people, uh, or names of organizations. So the people, place, organization. That's the fundamental thing they started looking for, right? Before that they didn't even have that. So, so, uh, but this was way, you know, before people started looking at the uh, domain-specific metadata or contextually relevant metadata. So we, we wanted to do that, and then once we did that, what we wanted to do was domain-specific metadata extensions, meaning I just explained to you that, hey, for movie I'm looking for this thing, for music I'm looking for something else. Is, is, can we consider semantic the, the way Google tried to use Google Plus in the last year? I mean, since Google Plus come out, uh, the research changed. I mean, I get content that are related to me, not only to this, the, 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 the specific domain. That is more of a personalization. Right. I mean, I, I, if I look for uh, any chat or for Emanuele della Valle, Emanuele della Valle is easier because there is a very important guy in Italy. He's a, an, a, a one, he's an entrepreneur. If I look for, it, for him, I will for sure find Emanuele because we are friends on Google Plus, we are friends in... Uh, on Facebook, so Google yes. is trying to, so it's kind of uh, semantic empowered also this part, or? Well, they did not necessarily, um, 
they didn't necessarily approach that as semantic. They necessarily uh, approach as um, ulti you see, and we'll discuss this a little bit later on uh, uh, when I discuss Peter Nordwig's blog and my blog. At that point, we'll discuss later on. But what the origin of uh, Google mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, they, they really believed in doing everything automatically. Right. Earlier in the class, I mentioned right uh, that. Uh, we had this Yahoo uh, directory experience, there are 9,000 mm -hmm. people and they didn't scale. Mm -hmm. uh, one person can do 50 pages a day, but <laughs> number of pages that were created. Then there are all dynamic pages, what do you do with them? So, <clears throat> uh, they really wanted to do everything bottom up. They want to do everything automatically. Whatever you may say, I told you that I used to employ we, uh, one and a half persons yeah. to maintain all my employees. Most people, uh, you know, m many, many people, uh, you know, in, in, in VC community, for example, they got afraid that, hey, you have people try to maintain that, even though the number of persons were minuscule. Mm -hmm. And they did not, they were not even computer scientists. I mentioned one of the guys was music major. But uh, they had mental block. And partly it was because, uh, you know, companies like Google and Arthur, they, they try to do everything totally automatically. If you look at search, and if you look at the content of those days, for most people, the search results were quite satisfying. Mm. Even if I can do better, why do they care? Yeah. <laughs> now, it depends on what you do with it. So, I showed you in my slide, I can do immediate merchandising. Mm. Right. They couldn't do that. Yes. Right? I could show you that I could create this this media reference object or info box. Mm -hmm. They couldn't do that then. Yeah. But it takes time to create a business model to show what value there is, how much money you can make because you can do that. Google's search, uh, Google's business model was clear. Mm -hmm. You do the search, and I'll do the advertisement, and I make money from advertisement. Mm -hmm. See, at the end of the day. You had to sell advertisement space to businesses to make money then. So I had all the technical capability, yet I had not managed to sell my abilities to do e-commerce and this and that yet. It takes a lot of money to do that. <coughs> and some of us are lucky and some others not. Just to give you background knowledge and you know, it's not interest for, for technical purpose, but if some of you are interested in entrepreneurship, for example, this will give you an idea. A lot of things in success uh, in, in the commercial world is also related to success related to timing, mm -hmm. okay, and uh, and luck, and and what happened was that um, Google, if I remember correctly, was started in 1997, and they uh, came from Stanford and they were smart and they created. Um, by the time I founded the company, they had created uh, um, uh, uh, they, 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 their, their investment was 25 um, million mm -hmm. from Sequoia and other top VC companies. Mm -hmm. I went in 1999 to get the money and I raised 2.4 million. I could have raised more, but my VC, um, I guess we were, I was not very experienced and then my, my second first VC company, right? But my 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 advisors and my VC uh, advised that um, uh, that's enough money. Uh, if you take too much money, you have to give too much company. But if your company is more valuable, then mm -hmm. the value uh, the valuation is high. Though, so you have to you can raise more money with giving out less equity. Mm -hmm. So that was a game they wanted to play, and most of the people were able to play that game, and I would have also played that game. Except I started in 1999, uh, August. Uh, I, I got the money in October. And April 2000, 2007, in less than a year, NASDAQ started to crash. Right? Google already had 25,000, uh, sorry, 25 million, and that was sufficient for Google until 2004 when they went public. If I had raised that much money, I would have enough time to pass the three important years. Mm. And those are years are very important because for those three years, 2001, 2 and 3, no venture capital, mm -hmm. 
invested in any company that had business model based on advertisement. Mm -hmm. My model was based on advertisement. You, you saw in my picture I yeah. showed you there are all those advertisement there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and commercial. Uh, 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 I, we had, I, I have other slides that I can show you. And Google's was advertisement. It's when Google went public and showed that you can actually make money through advertisement that everybody says, oh, now, yeah, 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 that's the way to make money. And they, they start giving again money. But by that time, you know, my 2004, uh, 2.4 million were running out and my company got then acquired by one of the customers. Mm. And then different things happen, right? But that's, that's what happened. So I was not able to uh, build uh, that way. So it's timing, it's luck, it's, uh, you know, advice and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and that's different from technology. This technology still survives. Mm. So uh, we got this domain, uh, uh, specific meta action. This is very unique. Mm. That I would extract different metadata and index different things mm. from uh, depending upon type of content uh, appropriate. Uh, you know that that I identify. Meaning that I classify. Classification is based on. I'll show you machine learning and other thing. That's very important thing. So then I got that, and then I would do this so-called semantic association traversal. What that means is that, for example, suppose I uh, found uh, <coughs> Microsoft, I will also uh, tag that content with MSFT. I will also index for that document MSFT. So if you search by MSFT, I can give you a document which does not mention MSFT, it mentions Microsoft. That's very powerful. That's semantic. When you type MSFT, you meant Microsoft, obviously, right? There's no, nothing else you could have made. And a search engine, typical search engine, syntactic search engine, like the Googles and others of that time, can't do that. They only see Microsoft. They did not have knowledge base at time. They do. They did started developing some interesting thing though. They're not, you know, they were very smart people, of course. They like this. They started creating, you know, things saying when Microsoft occurs, MSFT also occurs often. So they would have a clustering kind of stuff. Statistical correlation is something they would get, create, but that is not name relationship. They would not know at that level that MSST is the stock symbol of a Microsoft. Name relationship, they would not have that. I was a semantic web person. I have a paper, uh, first paper, I, I have a paper in 1998 that uses, uses RDF. Right? Uh, and so we had here a name graph, uh, label age graph model for, it did not have, we did not formally use RDF. Just the same way Google also does not use even RDF today for knowledge graph. But, um, uh, you know, uh, we use that richness, uh, name relationship. And I had explicit knowledge of that. They could start developing indirect knowledge. So, so then they can do, it's a similar, it's a similar in concept to collaborative filtering. Yeah, you heard of that term, you know, you know, do you know collaborative filtering, right? So, so what happens is like earlier when Amazon was uh, being built out, when you use, when you have this product, uh, and then you search and go to some other product, the system records all that. So then from that I can create statistics that when you are at this product, you may be interested in this product because all the other people before that, uh, before you did that, they, 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 with this product, I give you, let's say, random 10 products. You choose this. And then next person also chooses that. That means this is a preferred product next to that product. Right? That is collaborative filtering. Right? So statistical measure of, you know, uh, things that are being correlated. It's, it's not explicit. It's not formal. It is not uh, domain specific. And yet, it, and so it works partially. So this is where uh, I have another paper called Semantics for the Semantic Web. The implicit, the formal, and the power of the So the implicit is that collaborative filtering yeah. kind of the example. Approach. Patterns. The formal is what I am talking about. Where we actually have the knowledge base, mm -hmm. knowledge graph, world model, ontology. That is formal. Mm -hmm. Because I have named relationship. This is of exactly that type. I know that. 
And so that is what we did, and then we created a, a symmetric notation, and that is the enhanced text, which is what I showed you, right? And that is all indexed, and then this is made searchable. So this is the result of that annotation process. This guy. Right? Now, this is semantically annotated document. Whereby you would have say you would say let's see if I can uh, so you can see here Peter Cardillo is director of research at Global Partner Securities Triple right now let us look at the classification work that we did this was also very unique what is the name of this paper. Symmetric Enhancement Engine. If you Google that, you'll get it. Now look at this very unique uh, thing here. Remember I said I did classification. So here you can see I have a variety of base classifiers. I have HMM, Hidden Marco Model. And then I have something very unique called KBK. This is knowledge based classifier. And look at this thing, look at the accuracy. Highest accuracy among all the classifier came from knowledge base. And then we did um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what is it called, um, voting model or so. And, and so you get, uh, you know, um, boosting. And then we got this combined result. So you could, if you have good knowledge base, you can really do pretty well. This was very unique in those days. Okay, so this is the thing behind the scene in terms of how we did the classification. Uh, so, um, uh, interesting, this is one of my former uh, student, uh, PhD student who just shares with me that uh, his baby goes, started going to daycare. I, I'd like to keep in touch with you. Know, I, I'm glad they'd like to keep in touch with me. Anyway, so, um, uh, uh, now let's go here. Now this is a very important picture, at least for me, in my life. Let me go here. This was the secret sauce. So this is our architecture. Tali became um, score, then became Symagic score from Voket, which is the first company that acquired my company. Then it was acquired by Symagics and we renamed this to Freedom. Uh, this, this other, this probably, you know, one of the first, uh, probably the first semantic um, application building platform uh, that was ever built. So here this has three components. And I, I expect you to understand this very well. And I, I do want you to read this paper. So this is another paper. This paper is Managing Semantic Content for the Web. There is a link from my blog. By the way, what time is it? 20, 3.20. 3.20, so we yeah. made well, in that case, let us um, stop here because this will this is a very important thing, and we'll talk about this. Can you? Just